is the story of what happened when Hollywood glamour... She's got warmth, beauty, intelligence, wit, charm. ...met young British royalty. Harry, he's the acceptable face of the monarchy. And how they fancied each other. If anybody told me that one of the actors that I'm working with was going to marry into the royal family, I would say, get out of here, no way. <laughs> I could barely let you finish proposing. I was like, can I say yes now? We hear the intimate details of their courtship. They were constantly touching each other, putting their arm around each other. Told by those who know them best. And she said, Prince Harry, I'm meeting Prince Harry tonight. And I said, Prince Harry? <laughs> and we ask, what does the future hold for this most modern of royal couples? I do worry for her. We all have seen the power of the royals, especially the emotional weight they can throw. And I think he's met a, a, an extraordinary person. And I think they're going to have a tremendous life together. The moment is near. I won't say too much. Earlier this year, on a freezing cold day in South London, Thousands of people lined the streets of Brixton. The large crowd of Londoners had gathered to celebrate the arrival of Britain's coolest couple. You're locked in to represent 107.3 FM with me, Glory Talks. Everyone is listening, and I'm in the same room as the royal couple right now. If you don't believe me, ask around, because everyone's talking about it. Prince Harry, um, to me, strikes me as the, the lad of the family. And um, so that, that, I suppose, was, was where my interest was. I think because um, when you look at sort of um, some of the stuff that Prince Harry does in terms of volunteer work and, you know, community-based projects, and that's very much aligned with a lot of the stuff that I do in my spare time. <laughs> Megan's cool, man. Um, she's just, yeah, she's down to, she's down to earth. Um, the sort of brief exchange that we had, um, very humble, very gracious. You know, I get to... What they are saying is monarchy is an inclusive institution. It is not white Anglo-Saxon um, Protestant anymore. It is, it embraces everything and everybody. There's been so much discussion about what it means now to have a mixed-race duchess in the royal family, the difference that she can make when it comes to issues around inclusivity, racial disparity, discrimination. She is now going to be there at that top table, a table that often is seen as very male and pale. And is she going to bring something different to that? So what do we know about the woman from across the Atlantic who is set to revolutionise the royal family? Former actress and model Meghan Markle was born here in Los Angeles in August 1981. Her father Thomas is an Emmy Award winning lighting director who has worked on some of America's top television shows. And her mother Doria is a social worker who cares for the elderly. Meghan's parents split when she was six and they shared joint custody. And the divorce, along with her mixed race heritage, often made her feel like an outsider. She always felt a sense that she wasn't really part of the gang, as it were. She felt different. At the same time, she realised that she was a very smart girl and that people wanted her to know her because she was smart. Megan showed just how smart she was when, at the age of 12, she contacted America's top-rated current affairs show for children. Nick News. So I got this letter from a little girl. My name's Megan Markle. I'm 12 years old. And I just graduated from sixth grade, and I'm going to the seventh. She had been in her classroom, and they had watched another show on television, and a commercial had come up for ivory dishwashing soap. And in it, it said, for women with greasy hands or something like that all over America. When we first saw the commercial, I knew something would be done because I was furious. And she said, 
when it finished airing in her classroom, the little boys began to tease the little girls and say, well, that's all you're good for is doing dishes. You know, that's what girls do. They knew it hurt my feelings. It makes me feel like they're going to grow up thinking that girls are less than them. You know, like boys are better than girls. But while she did not think that was sexual harassment, she did think it was how these attitudes get started. And she had looked up and discovered that Procter & Gamble manufactured ivory dishwashing soap. So she wrote a letter to the president of Procter & Gamble, and she included that letter in her letter to me. The president of Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble Company, Cincinnati, Ohio. Dear sir, last week at my school, we decided to watch the news for social studies. While going through the channels, we saw a commercial for the new ivory clear dishwashing liquid. In the commercial, they said women are battling grease, meaning only women do dishes. When I heard this, the boys in my class started saying, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. First, they denied having gotten the letter, and I pushed and pushed, and finally they admitted they'd gotten it, and they had gotten several letters, and they were going to change the commercial, and they did. And at that point, we sent a crew out to do a story about this little girl, Meghan Markle. Uh, who at age 12 had found a voice and had discovered that she could use that voice and that she could change the world. For not just yourself, but lots of other people. In 1993, Megan attended the Immaculate Heart High School in the Los Angeles suburbs. By this time of her life, many of the anxieties of her early childhood seemed to have disappeared. Academically, she was ex an excellent student. She got an A for me uh, in the senior class that she took. Um, she was very articulate in class. When she'd raise her hand, you knew she had something to say that you wanted to listen to. Megan always seemed to light up a classroom. Uh, she did have this does have this very serious side uh, this very this side that really wants to delve into a text or to meditate or any of those things that the class asked for but on the other hand she she also was a very bright and cheerful presence in the classroom she was also popular with and supportive of her fellow classmates i called one of the girls who was in her class and i said do you remember anything? And she said, well, as a matter of fact, I still have the note that Megan wrote me. Dear Michelle, you are so strong and so wonderful. Your courage and strength in times of hardships is as admirable as your optimism and friendly nature. Never stop sharing your beautiful spirit and always remember how special you are. I am here if you ever need me. I love you, Megan, with a little heart. And the girl was so touched because she said, she took the time to hand write this to me, and she wasn't close to me, but she, she cared enough. So this is the kind of person that Megan was. And this was no isolated act of kindness. Megan's desire to help people took her onto the streets of Los Angeles to work with the homeless, often at great personal risk. She volunteered for uh, quite a long time um, at a kitchen on Skid Row. She continued long after her hours of service requirement was fulfilled. And she continued on through her senior year as well. Twenty years on from when Megan helped on these streets in downtown LA, the homeless situation has reached epidemic proportions. It's unconscionable, it's immoral, but currently in this 50 square block area are 5,000 people living on the street. And here today, busier than ever, is the soup kitchen where Megan volunteered. Every day they can feed up to 1,000 people who might otherwise starve. And for the very first time, the project's director talks of the young high school student who came to help the homeless. 
I remember her and her teacher would bring her down. She would come with her, her religion teacher and uh, do what everyone else was doing. She's a beautiful woman and you can't forget her face. Uh, but I didn't know the status until I heard it on the news that she was marrying Prince. So it was like, oh my gosh, someone I know is royalty. <laughs> The compassion that Megan showed for others during her formative years in high school has never deserted her, even at the height of her fame as one of the world's most famous television stars. You know, you'd serve the crew meal and there'd be a lot of leftover food and it would always get thrown away. And she wanted to give it to homeless people. And she kind of went up the ranks at the studio and made it, and made it happen, made it so that we didn't do that anymore. We didn't throw it away, we gave it to people. So I think that says a lot about a person's character. Like Meghan, Prince Harry has shown compassion for the world's less fortunate from a very early age. But for the young prince, his devotion to good causes was born out of a tragedy that almost destroyed him. He undoubtedly had a, a, a difficult and complex childhood. Um, if your mother had died in such high-profile circumstances, it's going to have an, an effect on you. Granny was christened in this. Three years younger than his bride-to-be, Prince Harry was born in September 1984. I was christened in this. He is the second son of Prince Charles, then married to the most famous woman in the world. It's all wrapped up. Yeah, yeah. got your break on. Yeah. <laughs> Harry had a very loving relationship with his mother. Diana had all sorts of problems and difficulties, but she was undoubtedly a very loving and a very demonstrative mother. And both boys, I think, really, really felt that love. Prince Harry talks about how she was a lot of fun, how they had some wonderful times with their mother, but also she would introduce them to those who had AIDS and HIV. And we can see now how that has fed into Prince William and Prince Harry's charity work and has had a huge impact, I think, on how they interact with the public and also that sense of service and duty that we constantly hear Prince Harry talking. I think people would be shocked if we saw a similar event today, having two boys at such a young age walking behind their mother's coffin. He was 12 years old. And how you get your head around that as a child, especially when you're in an institution where stiff upper lip comes first, service and duty comes first. And you can see from the boys in those images that I don't know how they were doing it, but they were holding it together. Once the funeral was over, I think there probably was an attitude of, we now get on with life. Uh, the period of mourning is over. Looking back on that, I think both boys, well, certainly Harry, um, would say that, that perhaps he should have had some more help at the time. And in public at least, it was very much royal business as usual. Conscious of his mother Diana's legacy, he threw himself into charitable work. In his gap year, in 2004, he travelled to Africa 
and set up a foundation to help orphan children in the tiny kingdom of Lesotho. What are you hoping that your time here is going to achieve for you personally? Uh, recognition on people back in England, charities in England, to sort of recognise Lesotho as you know, a country that needs help because they haven't got enough help yet. When he went over there, he saw that there were children who had been orphaned, lost both their parents as a result of HIV and AIDS. And I think he felt a real connection and a real bond with those young people. I've constantly seen it. He's incredibly good with children. But I think especially those who maybe have had a troubled childhood, he genuinely has this affection for, for young people. It was also clear that the demons unleashed by his mother's death were never far from the surface. Despite his charitable work, Harry developed a reputation as the wayward prodigal royal. And the press was soon on his case. Harry was going down into, into the local pubs and he was drinking underage. He was smoking cannabis both in the pubs and, and back at Highgrove. And the Prince of Wales had no idea about any of this. And of course, inevitably, it found its way to the newspapers. Despite the best efforts of the royal family to brush up his public image, the young Harry seemed to be permanently at war with the tabloids. I don't think Prince Harry did himself any favours during those years. I think he was rude, he was abrupt pushing photographers out the way, um, fighting with them outside nightclubs. They are never going to be good images. Yes, I can understand why he feels that way towards especially the paparazzi. The army proved to be the young prince's salvation. In 2007, Following his officer's course at Sandhurst, Harry was deployed under great secrecy to operations in Afghanistan. He was trained as a forward air controller. That's a soldier on the ground, a team on the ground, uh, whose task is to talk to the aeroplanes above. And that is a very frontline task because you've got to be out and about, you've got to be seeing what the issues are uh, in order to have absolutely accurate information. Much to his disgust, Harry's tour was cut short when a foreign magazine revealed his whereabouts and he had to return for safety reasons. Once again, he'd been foiled. And again, he hit the, the, um, hit the bottle, hit the, the nightclubs. Again, more ghastly photographs of him taking swings at photographers. Um, and then uh, the head of the army, General Sir Richard Dannett, now Lord Dannett, came to his rescue. We had lunch together and we talked about his experiences in Afghanistan and inevitably, you know, he had really enjoyed a really stimulating and challenging moment in his life. Hey, Roger, orange smoke now. I felt the likelihood of getting him back on the ground again was very negligible. Uh, and therefore I proposed at that meeting that we had over lunch that the best way he could get back to Afghanistan was in the anonymity of the cockpit of a helicopter. And therefore, he would need to train to become an Army Air Corps helicopter pilot. Harry proved to be an exceptionally gifted pilot, and he returned to frontline combat duties in Afghanistan in 2011. And by this stage of his career, the young officer had earned the respect of some of the UK's most elite special forces. He fitted in really well there, and that was what I was really surprised about, how gr grounded he is and how, how relatable he is. He, um, straight away, he never saw himself as, as an outsider. He saw himself as, as part of that team, and I think that's how he's had such a great career in the military. The press, of course, still following his every move, but this time, they were getting an altogether different story. For me, that was, uh, that, that hurt, being pulled out at that point, um, being dragged away from my guys. It just, I think it was all done. It, it wasn't done in the wrong way, but it was just.
Harry's military service undoubtedly saved him after the trauma of his mother's death. He had found something that he was spectacularly good at, better than other people at, and I think it was a fantastic boost to Harry's confidence, a boost that he had just never experienced before, and I think that was a real turning point for Harry. He's a delightful young man. I mean, we all know about Prince Harry when he was younger, um, falling out of nightclubs and that kind of stuff, but he was a young man. Uh, he undoubtedly had a, a, a difficult and complex childhood. As he said to me in, in one conversation, you know, rather with his shoulders going down, you know, I'm not like other young men. The period of time that he spent in the army was transformative and very helpful as far as he was concerned. But he's now um, a much, much more mature individual. In July 2015, Harry announced, with reluctance, he was leaving the army. He had decided it was now time for him to concentrate on his other royal duties. His very first tour at the end of his time in the military was to New Zealand. And it was here that he built up a rapport with a young Sky reporter, hoping for a world exclusive. Especially for Sky News. Down in one. We had just found out that he was leaving the army and there were obviously lots of questions that I certainly wanted to ask him about where he wanted to go next with his royal career. Right. That's really close. Sorry. Sorry. So I managed to, ne to negotiate this interview. I was told I would have 10 minutes with him. They're like gold dust. They don't give away interviews that easily. And for Prince Harry as well, he had not done an interview in a very long time. For you, um, seeing your brother settle down, does that put, not pressure, but does it make you think, actually, I'd quite like to settle down? Um, I, but isn't that the same for everybody? You know, there comes times when you think, right, now's the time to, to settle down, and, or now's not, what, whatever the way it is. But I don't think you can force these things. It's, you know, it'll happen when it's, when it's going to happen. Of course, I'd love to have kids right now, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's a process that one has to go through. And, you know, I, tours like this is great fun. Um, hopefully I'm doing all right by myself. It would be great to have someone else next to me is to, sort of sh to share the pressure. But, you know, it, um, time will come. Whatever happens, happens, I guess. I think it was then that it clicked. Just this was the most personal interview that he had ever given. And it is still one of the most personal interviews he's given when it comes to his private life and his hopes for the future. Harry had opened up for the first time in public about his desire to settle down. But despite his reputation as a ladies man, he had, until now, been unlucky in finding the one. He's had lots of girlfriends, but the two serious relationships, Chelsea Davey and Cressida Bonus, um, both of them, I think, were quite serious for a while, but both of them were very private individuals who suddenly found themselves on the front pages of every newspaper and who found their friends and relations all uh, suddenly the, the object of huge curiosity from the press and the photographers, and, and they frankly hated it. No one would ever dream Harry's perfect match was 8,000 kilometres away, working as one of the world's biggest television stars. She's beautiful. Uh, she walks into a room and kind of lights up the room. I know a place where the grass is really greener. Following her graduation in 2003, Megan had moved back to Los Angeles, determined to become an actor. Right now we're in Beverly Hills, and we're going to pass the... Um, Beverly Hilton Hotel, where I'll be on Sunday meeting the other Northwestern people. And what else are we doing? Oh, I have an audition today That's for right. a music video. Shakira. Shakira music video. She filled her time doing odd jobs and attending endless casting sessions. The aftermath of the audition, and it went pretty well. We just had to dance crazily. And, um, but even at an early stage of her career, her talent was obvious to those who worked with her. She can be looked at as a very, very natural actor. Uh, how she dissects a scene and, and delivers her lines is so unlabored. It just comes naturally. And you're just drawn into her for some particular reason. There you go. 
Okay, no, not a, we're not saluting the sun, so something else. Corey Maybe Grant directed Megan in one of her I've very first movie more. roles, in this yeah. 2011 yeah. comedy. Just try to sit. Uh-huh. Okay. There you go. All right, a little more. Uh, yeah, uh, I got no. more, I got more. Her energy was just, I don't know, just kind of brought you in, and then it made you, um, as a creator, become more, uh, your creative juices started to open up more because she was so receptive to everything that you were given and then given more. So her personality had a lot to do with that. It made you a lot, very, very comfortable in being around her. Well, see, I was thinking that a, a more provocative pole oh, would help. That's why you're not paid to think. When she landed the role of Rachel Zane in the hugely successful USA Network legal drama, Suits. The part of Rachel was, it was, it was a difficult role to cast because it required someone who had strength of character and also a good sense of humor. And uh, it was taking a while. We'd really gone through a long list of people and uh, some great actresses, you know, just not a perfect fit for the role. And then Megan walked in the door and she just nailed it. Megan stayed on Suits for six seasons, during which time it became one of the most popular shows on television, drawing millions of viewers. But in 2017, a new role in life meant it was time to give up acting. I'm equally disappointed that we're going to be losing who I feel is one of the premier actresses, uh, new actresses that we have um, in the industry. I mean, she's been around a little while, but she didn't even come close to what her uh, um, potential would be because she's so good. And I think we're really going to miss that. Meghan Markle successfully realized her lifetime ambition of becoming a successful actor. Okay, and looking this way. And, and her future way. husband also found looking his looking vocation way. after he left the army. Prince Harry often will talk about getting off the plane from Afghanistan, his first tour in Afghanistan in 2008. Also on board that plane, service personnel who were in comas, who had been injured in Afghanistan, and also the body of a soldier who'd been killed in Afghanistan. And it was from seeing that that he realised that more needed to be done for those who had been left wounded, sick and injured by serving their country. Among the many tasks Harry has undertaken to raise awareness was joining a group of ex-service amputees on their walk to the North Pole in 2011. Taking part was a former member of the Parachute Regiment who had lost his arm fighting the Taliban. All the guys uh, on the North Pole team, we, we felt we had that bond with him because he was a soldier as well. And there was no special treatment for him as well. He, he did everything we needed to do. He ate the same food as us, I had to sleep in a tent. He, he went through all the same things we did. Um, but quite annoyingly as well, because he was really good at it. The team reached the North Pole in record time and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. But for Harry, it was just the start of his help for heroes. He was the driving force behind the Invictus Games a kind of Olympics, if you like, for military people, particularly those recovering from, from injury. The thing about a, a young person who's seriously wounded on military operations, they may have had parts of their body blown away and have life-changing injuries, but in the core of them, they're the same determined, focused person that they were before. <sighs> And Harry's example is today helping to inspire the most remarkable feats of endurance. Dean Stott is currently attempting the world record for cycling the Pan American Highway. He's doing so to raise money for his old friend's mental health charity. If you catch these uh, things you know, early enough, uh, yeah. then, then, they don't, then they don't escalate into, into bigger problems. So for you to pick heads together is, is so important for us. The purpose behind Heads Together is to end the stigma around mental health. What I'm trying to promote on this challenge is also that physical activity can help your, your mental state. So I think the more people talk about it, the more people are aware about it. Someone like, like Harry can talk about it than, than anyone. So like I say, mental health doesn't discriminate. It can affect anyone, regardless of who you are. 
Dean has already smashed the South American record of the challenge by 10 days and is on course for taking the same amount off the world record when he finishes in a few days' time. <laughs> by his early 30s, Harry was predominantly making headlines for the charity work he carried out with William and Kate. There was still the intense speculation about his private life. But those who knew what was really going on had been sworn to secrecy. Megan and I were at lunch and um, she was really excited that day at lunch. And I said to her, you look fantastic, Megan. What's, what's going on in your life? Um, you, you seem excited. And she said, well, yes, I have a date tonight. <laughs> and I said, really, with who? Do I know him? And she said, yes, I'm sure you'll know him. I'm meeting Prince Harry. And uh, in a whisper, she sort of said, and I said, who? And uh, she said, Prince Harry, I'm meeting Prince Harry tonight. And I said, Prince Harry? <laughs> and uh, we had a discussion and we said, I said to her, my God, how wonderful and um, how exciting and, do you know what you're getting yourself into? Megan continued to confide in Gina throughout the early days of her romance. But in her professional life, she managed to remain perfectly discreet. Although those that worked with her on this fashion shoot in May 2017 had their suspicions something might be going on. She was very excited about something. And the fact that she was texting, like you have a friend and you see her texting, hey, what's happening there? And we could see that something was happening. And, um, but she was very private and very elegant about the details of that, uh, the relationship that was going on. Didn't say names, anything, but we knew that something very amazing was happening. By the time the Invictus Games opened in Toronto four months later, speculation about the couple had reached fever pitch. As soon as we got there, there was a very agitated looking press officer who said, everything that you film now, you're going to have to share. And I said, well, why? We're the only ones here. She said, you are going to have to share it. And I said, are you telling me that Prince Harry is not going to turn up on his own? And she said, that is exactly what I'm going to tell you, but you must not tweet it. But there they were, sunglasses on, about half a dozen close protection officers surrounding them, but just like a very ordinary couple holding hands, walking towards the wheelchair tennis. They took their seats, and that's when we all scrambled to try and get the pictures that you all see now of them sitting watching the wheelchair tennis together. It was an extraordinary moment. It was incredible. What struck me about that is that they were so tactile. They came out holding hands together as they were watching the sport. They were constantly touching each other, putting their arm around each other and, and smiling at each other. And that, that, that was really unusual and not used to that kind of um, level of, of affection shown for each other at um, sort of official events. As they left, he reached out to grab her hand and they walked off together. But they just genuinely seemed so happy together and so relaxed together. And I think it was at that moment that we all saw the wedding bells. took place at Kensington Palace in November 2017. They were absolutely fantastic to, to photograph that afternoon. Um, they came out walking arm in arm, they were smiling at each other, they were joking with the media, they were showing off the ring. Um, but there was one picture in particular that I really love. Um, it's, it's quite a wide shot, I shot it quite wide so you can see the situation, you can see some of the gardens. And it's just the two of them stood there on their own and they're both 
beaming, looking so happy, and they're looking um, straight at their, my, their arm in arm, and they're looking straight at my camera. Um, and it's just, for me, that just summed up, summed up the afternoon. And later, the couple gave their first ever joint interview, revealing the intimate secrets of their courtship. I'd never watched Suits. I'd, I'd never heard of Megan before, mm -hmm. and I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her, and there she was sitting there. I was like, OK, well, I'm going to really have to up, up, up my game here. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and, have a, and make sure I've got a good chat. I think for both of us, though, it was, it was really refreshing because given that I didn't know a lot about him, everything that I've learned about him, I learned through him, as opposed to having mm -hmm. grown up around different news stories or tabloids or whatever else, anything I learned about him and his family was what he would share with me and vice versa. So mm. for both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. But despite their optimism, there have already been darker moments in the couple's time together. And it was all down to the prince's traditional enemy, the tabloids. Megan had been married before to a Hollywood film producer, Trevor Engelson. The couple split in 2013, but the papers had a field day over whether it was suitable for a royal prince to marry a divorcee. And there were numerous intrusions into her private life, accompanied by unacceptably sexist and racist articles. Harry, six months into the relationship, issued a, um, a statement to the press saying, back off. This is my girlfriend and your treatment of her is unacceptable. The announcement made the depth of his anger clear. Prince Harry is worried about Miss Markle's safety and is deeply disappointed that he has not been able to protect her. He knows commentators will say that this is the price she has to pay and this is all part of the game. He strongly disagrees. This is not a game. It is her life and his. He thought, you know, I'm not going to have another relationship ruined by this kind of harassment. You know, we are human beings. This is my girlfriend and back off. And the saga, inevitably, has led to speculation about how Meghan will cope with the pressure of her new life. Lots of people would say, yeah, it makes sense that she's going to be comfortable. She's an actress. She's done all of her charity work before. She's used to the cameras. And I'm sure that helps to a degree. But you have to remember, we are dealing with a level of exposure that even she has never experienced in the past. Megan is unique. She is brilliant. She's articulate. I mean, it's not going to be easy to be in the limelight all the time. Uh, it's not going to be easy to have your every move scrutinized. But I think because she's got that depth, she'll know how to handle it. Perhaps the biggest challenge facing Meghan is how much she can adapt to her new role as a royal. She has always been proud to call herself a feminist. And in 2015, she gave a speech to the UN. Well, good evening. That doesn't feel like enough, does it? It's just great evening. Maybe that's and she better. started by recalling that all-important event from her childhood. A pivotal moment reshaped my notion of what is possible. See, I had been in school watching a TV show in elementary school, and um, this commercial came on with the tagline for this dishwashing liquid, and the tagline said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. <laughs> Two boys from my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. I remember feeling shocked. I wrote a letter to my news source at the time, Linda Ellerby, who hosted a kids news program. I was thrilled that she had grown up uh, to be a feminist that she was when she was 12 and that she was open about it and made no apology for her belief in women's rights and for her belief that she could use her voice to change her world. Women make up more problematic. I think we could potentially see a clash between her and what is expected from the palace. 
One issue that I find very interesting is she was UN Women's Advocate for Political Participation. She now will no longer be able to be politically active. She will be expected to be completely politically neutral. Others worry that Meghan's outspoken views and strong will recall the memory of Princess Diana, who caused so much disruption for the House of Windsor. I do worry for her. We all have seen the power of the royals, uh, and especially the emotional weight they can throw for or against someone. But I believe Ms. Markle is strong enough to withstand it. I hope it doesn't bring her down. Overall, there is a sense of optimism. Far from being a disruptive influence, Meghan, in her own unique way, could ensure the long-term survival of her new in-laws. I think the royal family has actually welcomed Meghan with open arms. My understanding is that they like her a lot. And I think, I mean, personally, I think that this is the best thing that could have happened to the royal family. With Meghan, we've got someone who is mixed race, who's a career woman, who's a divorcee, who's American, who comes from a broken home. These are all, I mean, she's more representative of our society today than the, you know, the, the blonde daughter of an aristocrat ever could be. I think in, in terms of, in a historical context, it's a, it's a milestone um, in the sense of, you know, um, the royal family accepting somebody um, of colour um, into, into their family and stuff. I don't necessarily look at it from the racial side of things, I just look at it as two people who clearly seem to love each other and get along really well. And this most modern of couples, with their different backgrounds but common values, have already made up their own minds about their immediate future. At the moment, for us, it's going to be making sure that our relationship is always put first. But um, no, look, both of us have passions for, 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 for wanting to make change, change for good. And, uh, you know, with lots of young people running around the Commonwealth, that's where we're going to spend most of our time, hopefully. And it was really one of the first things we connected on. It was one of the yeah. first things we started talking about when we met, was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. I think that was... Um, mm. That's what got date two <laughs> in the books, probably. Yeah, that's right. yeah, plenty to talk about. This is a man who is so passionate about the causes that matter to him. And I think now, with Meghan alongside him, they are going to make a very powerful couple, not just here in the UK, but globally. They have a huge opportunity to make an enormous difference. And despite what will inevitably be a hectic round of royal duties, there is hope they will find time for more important matters. Megan and I were at an event in the Cayman Islands and Megan discussed her future with me. And I said to her, Megan, what about kids? Are you, are you planning, would you like, like to have children? You've not had children and that's sort of a discussion that girls have and she said to me I would absolutely love to have children and I can't wait to be a mother. Megan, I'm very very happy for you and best of luck, best of wishes uh, from America. Always understand that you have each other and I will keep you both in my prayers. I just wish you all the best for your, your wedding day. Good luck and I will, uh, I'll see you on my return and hopefully share a drink.